our first session as soon as possible. Could you please take a seat? And we'll begin. I'd like to introduce the, um, the speakers on our first panel. The session chair is Dr. Samuel Arian. Also, I'd like to invite Dr. Earl Croissant to the, to the stage, please. Dr. Sahar Aziz. And Ambassador Ibrahim Basul. Ibrahim Rasul. Are you ready? I'll give two minutes to see if Dr. Ibrahim Rasul can make it to the stage. Okay, uh, Ambassador Rasul will be speaking last, so we'll give him time to come to the stage. I'd like to turn it over to our session chair, Dr. Sami, please. Thank you very much, always. Welcome again. This is our first session, which is the plenary session, and the theme or title of this session is Navigating Between Democracy and the Military in Muslim Societies. As you could see uh, from the title, this is the setting the stage for studying the different cases that will come afterwards. We have uh, three presentations in this uh, session. The first one is titled Civilian Control of the Military, Patterns of Successes and Failures. And our uh, speaker is Dr. Oral Croissant from Heidelberg University in Germany. And I would like to say a few words about Dr. Croissant. He's professor of political science and dean of the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at Heidelberg University in Germany. Before joining Heidelberg, he taught as assistant professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monetary, California. His main, his main research interests include civil military relations, democratic governance, and political institutions, democratization studies, modern authoritarianism, conflict studies, and comparative Asian politics. As you could see from his interest, he's probably the man to go to when it comes to civilian military relations. He has over 150 publications on the topic. He has extensive uh, bio, as you could see, uh, in the conference uh, booklet. Dr. Uh, Croissant, as I said, will set, he did a 66, as he will discuss in his speech, uh, survey of countries, uh, mostly in the Pacific, Asian Pacific, that dealt with civil and military relations, and he will share the results of his studies with us. Our second speaker is Dr. Sahar Aziz, and her uh, title is Guarding the Guardians towards democratic civil military uh, relations. Dr. Aziz is a professor of law, chancellor's social justice scholar, and a Middle East and legal studies scholar at Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, in the law school of Rutgers University. Her research investigates the relationship between authoritarianism, terrorism, and rule of law, particularly in Egypt. She's the founding director of the interdisciplinary Rutgers Center for security, race, and rights. She's a faculty also affiliate of the African American Studies Department at Rutgers University in Newark, an editor of a journal, as well as she has extensive publications in many topics, including obviously the topic at hand. Uh, she also has uh, several uh, academic 
credentials. You can read the, the, uh, the, the uh, bio in its entirety in the booklet. Our third presenter that we're waiting still is Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. And his title is Democracy and Perils of Civil Military Dynamics in the MENA Region. Professor Rasul is affiliated with Georgetown University, but prior to that, he is an activist uh, in South Africa and was one of the pioneers in the ANC uh, uh, for the uh, struggle against apartheid in the 80s. Uh, after that, he became the premier of the Western Cape, one of the main provinces uh, in South Africa. And after that, he became the South African ambassador to the United States uh, for about five years, between 2000, you know, I think um, 2010 through 2015. And as I said, he will uh, address the topic uh, as it pertains to the MENA region. So we are looking forward to all three presentations. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Croissant to start his presentation. Uh, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sami. Uh, can you get my PowerPoint on the screen, please? It's on the monitor, but not on the big screen. Ah, there we go. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sami, and also Siga for, uh, first of all, organizing this conference, and even better, for inviting me to this conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, while I understand that this conference is mainly about the challenge of uh, how to transition from military-led or military rule to democracy, in my presentation, I will focus especially on the question of reforming civil-military relations after the transition from non-democratic to democratic political order. In my presentation, I will examine the conditions under which new democracies succeed or fail in establishing civilian control of the military. In doing so, I will present findings from a multi-method research that is based on an original data set of civil military relations in 66 countries that have made a transition from non-democratic to democratic rule during the so-called third wave of democracy. That means from the early 1970s until 2010. But before I start with the, the empirical analysis, I'd like to uh, present three observations. First, democratization in a country is obviously not just about electing new leaders through free and fair elections. It entails a much more comprehensive political overhaul, and possibly the most significant factor in the success or failure of a nation's democratic transition and subsequent consolidation is establishing democratic civil-military relations. Second, reforming civil-military relations in post-authoritarian regimes is more complex than the issue of civilian control over the military. Rather, the key issue is how to create and preserve a military that is on the one hand subordinate to political control, but on the other hand is also effective and efficient. And civilian control of the military is not the same as coup avoidance. The assumption that civilian control exists where militaries do not attempt to supplement a government by the threat of violence is of limited value. It ignores that military or security forces today are more likely to endanger democracy by lessening its quality and depth than by threatening its outright and swift overthrow. Of course, Turkey is the case that uh, proves the rule. And third, civilian control of the military comes in many shapes. In democracies, it is subject to clear and well understood rules that must be independent of the identity of political officials. It is concentrated in government and control over the government is subject to political competition and institutional constraints. However, 
There is a rich literature on civil military relations in autocracies or authoritarian regimes that demonstrate the ability of non-democratic leaders to find alternative but effective solutions to the guardianship dilemma. Moreover, democratically elected political leaders can use their control over the military apparatus for illiberal and undemocratic means. The rest of my presentation will proceed in four steps. First, I introduce my conceptual framework. Second, I present some descriptive statistics about the levels and patterns of civilian control over the military in third wave democracies. Third, I will examine the conditions under which new democracies succeed or fail in established firm civilian control of the military. And fourth, I'm going to discuss very briefly the role of political actors and their strategies of political control. There is obviously no agreement among scholars on what exactly civil in control over the military entails, nor is there a generally agreed definition on military uh, control or how these concepts should be measured. However, in recent years, scholars have advanced conceptions that share two fundamental assumptions. And Rafael Martinez, for example, in his book with Pion Berlin on Latin America has also developed such an approach. First, civilian control is about the political power of the military relative to the non-military political actors. Second, and related, Political military relations, a term that has been introduced by Risa Brooks, who is also here at this conference, can best be understood as a continuum ranging from full civilian control to complete military dominance over the political system. I conceptualize civilian control over the military as a gradual phenomenon. It's a question of more or less. Civilian control is about the degree or extent of political authority of civilian elites relative to the military. I define civilian control as a particular state in the distribution of political authority in which civilian political leaders, either democratically elected or autocratically selected, have the full authority to decide on national policies and their implementation. Under civilian control, and democratic control is just a specific form of civilian control, civilians make all the rules, and they can change them at any time. They may delegate the implementation of some policies to the military, but there is a clear dividing line between political decisions and military implementation of political goals. Moreover, to analytically capture different aspects of civil-military relations, which by definition is a multidimensional concept, I propose a conceptual framework that disaggregates civilian control in five different decision-making areas. Elite recruitment, public policy, internal security, national defense, and military organization. And when we talk about civilian control or democratic civilian control, the question is how much control do civilian or democratically elected civilian elites have over each of these five policy dimensions. By evaluating the degree of civilian control over each of these five areas, it is possible to identify the level of civilian control in a given country at a given point in time, and to identify co cross-country differences. To evaluate the degree of civilian control in 66 countries in the period 1974 to 2010, my team and I undertook extensive and in-depth survey of the relevant scholarly literature on civil military relations for each of the countries in our sample. This slide shows you a map of all countries included. The operationalization of civilian control was based on the multidimensional conceptual framework, which evaluates the overall degree of civilian control over the five decision-making areas 
each with a number of dimensions and indicators. I'd be glad to elaborate on the indicators in the Q&A, but because of lack of time, I won't dive deeper into this right now. So our data set includes information on 66 countries, 78 democratic regimes, 1,100 16 countries. This information is qualitative and we translated it into numeral scores to measure the level of um, civilian control in each of these countries. That resulted in a so-called civilian control score or PSYCOR. This figure summarizes the distribution of the civilian control scores across the 1,116 countries in our data set. As you can see, third wave democracies have been overall relatively successful in establishing firm civilian control over their militaries. The category of high civilian control includes about half of all observations in our data set with a within category average of 0.93 on a scale from zero to one. Zero means low civilian control, one means high civilian control. The medium high category is about one quarter of our observations, and the medium low and low categories are substantially smaller, with about 20% and 5% of the data set. This slide shows you the civilian control score in each country in the first year after democratization, as well as the maximum degree of civilian control achieved in each country throughout the period 74 to 2010. As one would assume, former civilian regimes had a greater average degree of civilian control in their first democratic year, as compared to democracies that came out of military-led dictatorships. In addition, former civilian regimes did better in establishing and maintaining strong civilian control over the military, with former civilian autocracies maximally reaching on average a civilian control score of 0.78. In comparison, former military regimes do consistently worse than their civilian counterparts with an average maximum degree of a civilian control score of 0.78. 55. That is a first indicator that former military regimes or post-military democracies face more difficult circumstances in establishing civilian control than former non-military-led authoritarian regimes. While democracies with medium-low and medium-high control can be found in most regions, and here you see, for example, where Turkey is in our data set in the year 2010, or other countries, but I'm not going into the details, I just want to show you this slide. While democracies with medium-low and medium-high control can be found in most regions, overall the new democracies of Southern Europe and post-communist Eurasia have been most successfully on average compared to other regions. Here, the level of civilian control or institutionalizing civilian control is more advanced than in other regions. Given the circumstances, however, democracies in sub-Saharan Africa have been surprisingly successful in achieving at least a medium level of civilian control. In Middle East and North Africa, and unfortunately we have only three countries in our data set that come from this or belong to this region, Lebanon, Turkey, and Sudan in the 1980s, the regional average is the lowest. So we see strong regional differences in the level of post-authoritarian civilian control. And the question is, of course, how do we explain these factors? Which factors can account for the success or failure of institutionalizing civilian control over the military in post-authoritarian democracies? There is no shortage of arguments in the literature. My theoretical argument centers on civilians as the relevant actors. It's the civilians who do or do not initiate change in civil-military relations. At the end of the day, success or failure of institutionalizing civilian control in new democracies depends on the political elite's ability to contain the military's political power through strategies of political control. 
However, political elites, political leaders' decisions to employ specific control strategies and their effects do not occur in a historical or political vacuum, but are affected by the resources available to civilians. Therefore, civilian strategies are shaped by specific contexts they are faced with. Context is a very broad and all-encompassing category and a list of possible substantive factors that have been considered in civil-military relations is very long. Not all of these potential relevant factors can or should be integrated into an explanatory model. There is no factor that has not been mentioned in the literature that could affect civil-military relations. My research identifies 12 factors in six different categories, you see them here, which plausibly could affect the successful application of civilian control strategies in new democracies. As our dependent variable is constructed on an interval from one to zero, the civilian control score, we employ factional response logic regression models. I'm not going into the details. We estimate different models and also run alternative model specifications, including QCA, OLS regressions, topic truncated models. And the good news is the results seem to be fairly robust. The following slide, this slide, illustrates the average effects and confidence intervals of the individual var variables in our model one, our baseline model. Out of the 12 variables, those, that are discussed in the literature, neither the variables measuring external or internal threats, civil wars or external confrontation with a hostile uh, neighbor or hostile power, nor those capturing the degrees of mass and elite consensus, nor a country's democratic neighborhood, nor income inequality, are meaningful predictors of civilian control in new democracies. Out of the six variables which were identified to have at least a medium degree of correlation with civilian control, five have a substantive impact on the degree of civilian control in new democracies when holding other variables constant. Five can explain to some extent the variation in the level of civilian control among these 66 countries and 78 democracies. Number one, Praetorian legacies. Number two, military control over the transition and ethnic inequality, on average reduce the degree of civilian control in new democracies. The stronger Praetorian legacies, the more military control over the transition to democracy, and the more ethnic inequality in a country, the more unlikely it is it will achieve a high level of civilian control. <laughs> Membership in the European Union and NATO, a strong civil society and an institutionalized party system, on the other hand, will raise the average degree of civilian control. This slide illustrates the average effects of civilian control for different values of the six vari relevant variables. It shows in terms of substantive effect size, the single strongest predictor variable is the strength of civil society. The second strongest positive effect is membership in international organizations that require high standards of civilian control, especially European Union and NATO. And other factors had constant membership in EU or NATO rises the civilian control score by 0.2 points. That is by one-fifth on the scale from zero to one. The largest negative impact on civilian control in new democracies is exerted when the military was the dominant actor during the transition. High ethnic inequality also has a meaningful negative effect on civilian control. And the smallest effect of the six relevant variables, variables is exerted by the previous regime type. So we have six, we identified six variables which can explain quite a large amount of the variation in our data set. Three have a positive impact on civilian control, three have a negative impact on civilian control. Of course, context cannot completely explain the outcome. Contextual factors can only become causal through the actions of political actors. Therefore, the agency of political decision makers plays an important role. In fact, civilian control over the military in new democracies is the outcome 
often complex interplay between structural factors, the six variables, and contingent human agency. The crafting of civilian control of the military ultimately depends on the ability of civilians to break existing patterns of civil military relations and to introduce new institutions of civilian control. For this, they need strategies, and these strategies aim at coping, recruiting, appeasing, or intimidating military officers. While it is the conduct of political action which explains the extent to which civilians succeed, the context presents the resources and opportunities for the actors. The tentative results of our cross-national analysis suggest that ultimately there is no single strategy, no single recipe for success when it comes to civilian control attempts. However, there seem to be a number of tentative conclusions possible from our reading of these 66 countries and 78 democracies. First, when undertaking a process of reform, civilians must be sure that there is a consensus between democratic forces in the place that translates to a maximum political support for the changes planned. An agreement between, between political parties that they will not seek the armed forces' support for their respective census is crucial because, as Nasser Serra, former Secretary of Defense of the Kingdom of Spain, explained in his book, an army, quote, unquote, an army that's been courted is an army that's difficult to reform. Second, the engine of civil military relations must be domestic government and institutions. Military bureaucracies are famously resistant to change, and they have their entrenched political interests. Without civilian initiative, civil military relations will stagnate and armies will resist necessary reforms in response to changes in the democratic context. It seems unlikely that change can emerge from inside the armed forces. This is why civilian leaders must intervene to force change in civil military relations. Third, civil, mil civil military relations must be envisioned as a gradual process. And it contains a necessary element of trial and error. To me, it seems plausible to assume that gradualism proceeds over revolutionary change. Last but not least, and that's my last point, military reform must not be geared toward punishing officers and weakening security institutions. Rather, the ultimate objective of the reform is to build strong armed forces that can effectively defend the nation and simultaneously support the norm of civilian supremacy and democracy. For example, elected leaders may feel tempted to take advantage of opportunities to purge the military and to institutionalize personal strongman control over the military and other security forces. And to that end, he or she is dominating all domains of civil military relations. While this would allow him or her to wrest power, and we have examples in our, in our sample of female leaders who tried these strategies, while this would allow him or her to wrest power from the military, a short-sighted strategy of personalizing military control can backfire, may diminish military effectiveness, and can contribute to the destruction of democracy, in that case not by the military, but by the actions of civilians and politicians who have been elected to lead democracy. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Croissant. Very interesting uh, findings, and I think we'll have a lot of questions on that. Our second presenter is Dr. Sarah Aziz from Rutgers University, and her title is Guarding the Guardians Towards Democratic Civil Military Relations. Sahar. Salam alaikum. Thank you to Dr. Samuel Arien, the Center for Islamic and Global Studies, and Istanbul Zain University for hosting this timely conference. It is truly an honor to be here today in Istanbul among such a distinguished group of scholars to address a topic of crucial importance to the Middle East region. The fragile balance between the military tasked with protecting a nation from external threats 
and civilian political leaders responsible for internal governance in the service of their people. Civilian military relations is shaped in large part by a country's history, political system, and economic structures. Thus, my attempt today to examine a complex region through the lens of democratization risks erroneously homogenizing over 15 countries with disparate histories. That being said, there are lessons we can glean from a region-wide and comparative analysis. The Middle East is at once a fascinating and troubled part of the world. Centrally located between the East and West, the region boasts the origins of multiple civilizations that ruled vast lands and diverse cultures, whose inventions and scientific discoveries continue to benefit the world until the present day. But with its richness comes the lust of foreign invaders, eager to control the Middle East natural resources, trade routes, and its people. We witnessed this most recently over the past two centuries through European colonialism. With colonization came armed resistance and ultimately self-determination. In many of the post-World War I nations of the Middle East, it was the armed forces who pushed out oppressive rulers under European tutelage. Some noteworthy examples include Army Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser, who led the free officers movement that toppled King Farouk's government in July 1952. The Iraqi military moved King Faisal II's government in 1958 under the banner of Iraqi nationalism. And of course, right here in Turkey, General Kemal Ataturk led the nation for 15 years after the Ottoman Empire's defeat and loss of massive territory during World War I. Now, to be sure, civilian stakeholders also fought for independence. However, the military's intervention was vital, so much so that the so-called revolution, in quotes, was actually a coup against foreign or domestic civilian rulers. As a result, the military officer became a symbol of selfless patriotism, and the military became the guardian of the state. Right here in Turkey, the military regards itself as the guarantor of domestic stability and the guardian of the nationalist ideology of Kemalism. But what happens if the soldiers do not want to return to the barracks after the revolution is over? How do we prevent the military from preying on society rather than protecting it? Put simply, who will guard the guardians? These questions are perennial and universal. Political scientists and lawyers have filled thousands of pages attempting to answer them. Some emphasize political structures, others focus on legal and constitutional mechanisms, and yet others look to the socialization of the public and the military for certain values. The answers, in the end, are highly context-specific. There's no shortcut or magic formula for solving what is commonly referred to as the civil-military problematique. That is, a civilian government's desire to have a military strong enough to do anything the civilians ask them to do, but with a military subordinate enough to do only what civilians authorize them to do. Some commonalities exist among states who have been more successful than others in balancing civil-military relations for the purpose of maintaining a democratic political system. Now, because I am a US-trained lawyer, I will reference the United States as a case study of an advanced democracy. But by doing so, I do not argue all countries should be like the United States. Indeed, among one of the key differences between the United States and Middle East nations with large militaries is that since the Declaration of Independence, Americans have mistrusted standing armies and have seen them as instruments of oppression and tyranny, as opposed to the representation of patriotism. When looking to advance democracy, six common attributes stand out. First, the, co the commander in chief is a civilian. Usually the president or prime minister, he or she has the final say in when and how to deploy the military. Second, the civilian government appoints a civilian minister of defense. And if the appointee was formerly in the military, there is a minimum number of years that must pass since his or her service. In the United States, the National Security Act mandates the Secretary of Defense is a civilian who has not served in the armed forces for the preceding seven years. It used to be 10, and then it was amended to shorten it. The law also mandates that the deputy secretary, the undersecretaries, and the assistant secretaries of defense, and even those of the military department secretaries must all be civilians. 
Third, there must be an independent parliament that controls the budget of the military, thereby requiring civilian financial oversight. This produces more transparency and efficiency in defense budgeting, procurement, and auditing. To ensure military policy is continuously scrutinized and publicly debated, the US Constitution prohibits Congress from appropriating funds to the military for more than two years at a time. Thus, the Department of Defense requests, every two years, appropriations from Congress that are vetted by 50 to 70 civilian staff members on the House and Senate Armed Services Committees. Fourth, elected or duly appointed civilian politicians decide the security priorities and policies of the state with the input from a competent military. In the US, the National Security Council reports directly to the president and includes only one military officer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as the statutory military advisors to the NSC. And only Congress has the power to declare war pursuant to Article I of the Constitution. While the military has autonomy in its operations, it must defer to the civilians on the broader, more important policy decisions. Fifth, the military's jurisdiction does not encompass internal threats, which is under the purview of police and internal security forces. And this is particularly important in the Middle East because oftentimes the military use terrorism, the internal threats of terrorism, as pretext to engage in internal security. In the US, Congress passed the Posse Comitatus Act to prohibit the military, the use of the military in civilian law enforcement. Exceptions have been made, such as in 1881, Congress created an exception to allow military involvement in drug interdiction at the borders. In 1989, Congress designated the Department of Defense as the single lead agency in drug interdiction efforts. However, citizens must be diligent that such exceptions do not normalize the military providing internal security, for this may lead to the officers demanding an increased role in domestic governance. And finally, the sixth factor, there should be constitutional measures establishing civilian authority over the military, as well as legally defined missions, operations, and campaigns for the armed forces. Now, for all of these factors to exist, there must be democratic governance. Indeed, that is the prerequisite for civilian authority over the military. This poses significant challenges for citizens in non-democratic countries where the military is one of the impediments to democratization. To be more democratic, civilians need to control the military. But for civilians to control the military, the nation must be more democratic. So as you can see, this is one of the biggest challenges that faces people in the Middle East, and it was on full display during the Arab Spring and after the Arab Spring. So this leads us to the question of why so many Middle Eastern countries lack democratization. And there are many, many factors. It's a separate conference we could, we could have on that question. But at least four causal factors are worth highlighting. First, the weakness of civil societies, and in particular, their inability to constitute a credible counterweight to challenging militarized centers of power. Second, economies that are usually state controlled in a state where the military has significant power. Third, high levels of poverty, illiteracy, and inequality. And finally, fourth, foreign economic and military support of current authoritarian leaders, which is something that is uh, certainly a problem with regard to the US relationship to many Middle Eastern countries. The prevalence of these four factors produces four types of regimes that Professor Kamran Mahrava theorizes exist in the Middle East with regard to civil military relations. So the first type of regime is what he calls the ostensibly democratic state which includes Turkey, where the state predominates but allows the military to play an important role in domestic politics. Notably, since, in, since its founding in 1923, Turkey has had four major, excuse me, four military coups, two full-blown overthrows of the civilian governments and temporary rule in 1960 and 1980, and two forced resignations and replacement of civilian governments in 1971 and 1997. Each was justified by the military, either overtly or covertly, as necessary to preserve secularism against internal political Islamist forces. Since Turkey's ascendancy to the EU candidacy in 1999, however, its civilian military relations have shifted to provide civilians more control over time. For example, Turkey changed the composition of its national security membership by increasing the number of civilians. In 2004, Turkey abolished the state security courses courts and imposed and limitations imposed on the laws regarding the states of emergency. And most recently in 2010, a nationwide constitutional referendum 
removed Article 15 from the Constitution, which banned the prosecution of the 1980 coup leaders. And as a result, two leaders were prosecuted in, 19, in 2012, an unprecedented event in the region. And Article 145 of the Turkish Constitution was also amended to restrict military courts only to military officers. Non-military persons can no longer be tried in military courts except in wartime. The second type of regime is the, set, is the inclusionary states, which include Iran and Iraq, in which the regular military's political aspirations are kept in check and neutralized by highly ideological, largely voluntary militias, which I'll get to a little bit later. Then comes the third type of regime, the exclusionary states. In them, the once ideological officers are still in power, but have now civilianized themselves, what we call the officer autocrat, and much of the machinery, or the officer politician, and much of the machinery of the state having in the process become largely non-ideological civilian autocrats. Algeria, Egypt, Syria, and Sudan are examples of exclusionary states. Now in Egypt, the consequence of the so-called ruling but not governing military is a vast economic enterprise beyond the reach of civilian oversight. For example, the Egyptian military owns and operates cement factories, bottled water plants, food uh, factories, a garbage bag factory, one of the largest malls, and medical facilities. Because it employs conscripted soldiers in most of these business enterprises, it co its cost of production is much lower than the private sector, giving it an unfair market advantage. And Law 32 of 1979 allows the military to take the off-the-book revenue from these activities and place it in special private bank accounts. And because the military's economic affairs are classified as state secrets, financial details about the military's shadow economy are unknown to the government and the public alike. And finally, Article 203 of the 2014 Egyptian Constitution limits disclosure of the armed forces budget to only a single figure in the state budget. That's the only information that the public can have about it. And Article 201 and 234 of the 2014 Egyptian Constitution mandates the Minister of Defense is an officer who is appointed by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. So as you can see, at least in Egypt and many of these other countries, the structures are not in place to ensure, at least the legal and constitutional structures are not in place to ensure civilian control. In Iran, the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps members reportedly has become a vast military-based conglomerate with a multi-billion dollar business empire reaching into nearly every sector of the economy. It runs laser eye surgery clinics, manufactures cars, builds roads and bridges, develops gas and oil fields, fields and controls black market smuggling. And while it is impossible to know the extent of the military's involvement in their economies, their siphoning of resources in secret erodes the civilian government's ability to represent the people and to govern. And finally, the fourth type of regime is the monarchies, either those whose small geographic and demographic, demographic size compels them to rely on foreign mercenaries, such as Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, which rely on one or more loyal tribal uh, contingents to counterbalance the influence and potential autonomy of the regular military, such as Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia. So when the Arab Spring happened, it disproved many Islamophobic and Orientalist theories that Arabs are not ready for democracies, or Muslims do not want democracy. The people's brave nonviolent resistance to authoritarianism, much of which was undergirded by Middle Eastern militaries and their Western allies, including the United States, put to rest the fallacy that the people of the Middle East are not interested in democracy. But as we witnessed over the past eight years since the Arab Spring, the people's desire for democratization was not shared by their militaries, the same people who claimed to be their guardians. Even worse, the generals killed the very people they were sworn to protect. In Egypt, the military pretended to be neutral arbiters among civilian disputes only to firmly take the reins of power starting in 2013. Sadly, the so-called January 25th revolution and its aftermath produced an even more powerful Egyptian military that went from ruling behind the scenes to openly governing and controlling much of the economy. In Syria, the military viciously kills its own people when they nonviolently protest for freedom from what has effectively become an al-Assad dynasty. The Syrian military's brutality triggered the most the worst refugee crisis in modern history with over 13 million Syrians internally and externally displaced, many of whom are here in Turkey. 
In Bahrain, the king welcomed Saudi Arabia and the UAE sending 1,000 troops and 500 troops respectively to assist Bahraini security forces brutally cracking down on protesters. And even in Iraq, which is still rebuilding after 24 years of brutal dictatorship by a military officer, Saddam Hussein, and nearly a decade of American occupation, the Iraqi military is one of the impediments in the democratization efforts. So this begs the question, why couldn't the people bring the military under civilian control in their attempts to democratize their government? Some insights may come from the decades of coup proofing that has taken place in Middle East countries since their independence from colonial powers and served, and, and was something that I think many of the revolutionaries underestimated. So non-democratic governments face a political moral hazard. They need a strong military Excuse me, a strong military might not simply work as an agent of the elite, but may turn against them in order to create a regime more in line with their own objectives. So to secure the officer's loyalty, the government relies on political, family, ethnic, or religious loyalties in recruiting, promoting, and assigning soldiers. For example, in Iraq, Saddam Hussein relied on Sunni Muslims. In Syria, Hafez al-Assad relied on his fellow Alawite minority to control the military. In Bahrain, Sunni Muslims had the military of a majority Shia country. And under Qaddafi, the military was comprised largely of the Western tribes in Libya, Libya with whom he was associated. So by staffing military and security forces with members of their own group or their own tribe or their own sect, Middle East dictators are able to secure their own survival. For if the people remove the regime, the military leadership will also go with it, making the military opposed to revolution. Non-democratic governments also engage in what we call counterbalancing techniques that create rivalries between existing military units as well as establish paramilitary organizations with command structures outside the regular army. Iraq's former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, for example, separated elite special forces brigades from military command and placed them in a line of command directly under his office. He also exercised direct control over all Ministry of Interior forces, including the Border Guard and Federal Police, which then served as counterweights to the traditional military. This is in addition to his purposeful shiification of the armed forces, the same strategy used by Saddam Hussein, but instead with Sunnis. And of course, there is Iran with the three paramilitary groups, the Army of the Guardians of the Islamic Revolution, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and the Basish, a 300,000 strong paramilitary force affiliated with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. So these paramilitary groups not only prevent military coups against the autocrat, but also prevent popular nonviolent uprisings that may otherwise have been supported by a military whose legitimacy arises from the people. The price, however, is not only an absence of democracy. Leaders who engage in coup-proofing strategies also lower military effectiveness. This exposes states to losses in interstate war, as was the case in 1967 when the Egyptian, Syrian, and Jordanian armies suffered a humiliating defeat to Israel. The risk of losing interstate wars in a region where such conflicts are unfortunately common may be the opening citizens can use to call for militaries to stay out of internal governance and to allow civilians to have more control. Losing wars causes a loss in public confidence in the military. And because much of the military's real power lies with its informal influence among the public, rather than the legal framework or the constitutional mechanisms, the military has an interest in preserving its legitimacy among the citizenry. Now, political science have identified things as professionalization and institutionalization of the military as one means of establishing more civilian objective control of the military. This translates into a military that is rule-bound and based on meritocratic principles. Officers are governed by a clear set of rules where career paths and promotion is based on performance, not political or other loyalties. And more importantly, civilian control requires a recognition by military officers of the limits of their professional competence in internal and foreign affairs. In exchange, the, st the state grants the military a certain amount of autonomy in its operation. So in the end, civilian control of the military is not a fact, but a process, one that proceeds at a different pace and to different degrees in each country, and one that is highly, highly context specific. Now, and while all countries experience the process differently within and across regions, their people share one thing in common. They want to be protected, not persecuted, by their guardians.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahar, for your presentation. Two excellent presentations. Our third presenter, he arrived this morning, so there is, there is a delay. Uh, and he's coming here, he's on his way. So we'll proceed with questions and answers, and then when he gets here, he will join us. And I would like to start uh, by asking our two esteemed presenters. Um, Dr. Kulsan mentioned many factors in that relationship. I want him to elaborate a bit about what he thinks civilian elites could do, and specifically in a scenario where you have a suffocating military that is controlling every aspect of life in society. Civil organizations or civil society is, is weak, uh, yet they would like to do something, and obviously it's a repressive, repressive type of an environment. So what does he think that civilian uh, elites uh, could do? And, and secondly, uh, with the, uh, the other factor that has to the external factor, what does he think that could, they could do outside to lessen that repressive regime? In other words, what could uh, the people who are trying to change or transition to democracy, what could they do as far as the external powers are concerned? What does he think the weak points are where they can actually press hard? And for Sahar, if she can also elaborate in the context of the Arab region about what she thinks uh, should be the priority in terms of uh, putting that uh, military uh, on notice. You know, we have seen recently, and I think we'll elaborate about that uh, this afternoon further in the second session. What, what does she think that those who are outside also, what they could do in order to lessen the grip of the military over civilian life? As she, she has given many conditions, but this will be great in a established, developed society, but where we don't have that, how we get there? That's the question I'm trying to get. So we'll back then, and then I will open it to the floor. Dr. Persson. Thank you very much for uh, two very uh, hard to answer or even reply uh, questions. Uh, so, okay, what can civilians do in a very, very difficult environment? First of all, I mean, I'm, I'm a political scientist. I believe in empirical data, and I think there are contexts under which civilian control cannot be achieved, number one. This is an exception, of course, but there are some places, some societies, some political systems which simply do have very highly unfavorable circumstances for civilian control. Like, for example, Yemen, like, for example, Myanmar, uh, and there are certainly more countries on this planet, or Pakistan, I assume. It's really just extremely difficult. Uh, what can they do? So, uh, well, first of all, choosing a gradual approach. Uh, that means then the strategy of, of increasing or strengthening civilian control should be a gradual, not a big bank strategy, which would only uh, lead to a backlash on the military, probably the end of civilian role, uh, rule or democracy, um, trying to create civilian know-how about defense issues, about military issues, because often civilian elites do not know much about the military, they do not know much about defense, and very often they even don't care about it. At least that's my, my experience. Um, strengthening civil society, which takes time. These things take time. Uh, so, uh, um, and, and, and Turkey, for example, has much more beneficial, or Tunisia, much more beneficial context to introduce uh, civilian control than many other countries. Although, they, at least Turkey has a, a history of military intervention and praetorianism. Second factor, external, uh, second question, external factors. Well, this, all this military training, IMED stuff, that's nonsense. I haven't seen any study that would show evidence that IMED programs, military education training, would have an impact on military attitudes towards civilian control. And it's highly unplausible to assume that military training it, at an American or a German military university or wherever in Western democracy would have an immediate impact on civil military relations. Those generals, those officers are mid-level officers. That will take 10, 20, 25 years until they end up in positions where their individual attitudes could make a difference. The set external factors play a role, but I don't think it's this military training stuff. Uh, being or want to become member of an international organization or supranational organization like NATO after 1990 or like the European Union that forces its members or potential members to adopt rules and institutions of civilian control. So 
that sets an incentive for military officers and for civilians to adopt rules and norms and institutions of civilian control. That can make a difference, at least in our finding. Or, for example, it's very interesting to look at how participation in uh, UN peace, um, uh, peace missions has an, can have an effect on civilian control under certain circumstances. Or the anti-coup clause in Western Africa or the organization of American states uh, in, in Latin America. These organizations can have an impact, but by providing incentives, not by changing norms or perceptions. Okay. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the benefits of being in an academic conference is you don't have to come up with all the answers. You just identify the, the problems. It's much easier to be an academic than a policymaker or a politician. Um, I don't, what we learned in the Arab Spring, and it's not the first time the lesson was learned, is that it's not all going to happen all at once. And if it does, you could create, w replace one bad system with another bad system, and all you're doing is just shifting its musical chairs. So I have become convinced that the gradual system is probably a better one. And I think if you look at Turkey, that is a good example of a gradual system where right now I think the military, maybe not to their pleasure, those in the military has, although it still plays an important role, uh, is not as powerful as it was uh, at least prior, certainly prior to 1999 and the farther you go back in history. And so the question is looking at places like Turkey that at least are within the region and asking why, you know, how has this happened? There are a couple of things that come to mind. Um, so first is I think that most militaries in the Middle East do care about their legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And they engage in a lot of propaganda to try to ensure that the militaries see them as the patriots and as the guardians. And, you know, to the extent that that becomes compromised, I think you can have some convergence of interest between people in the military and people in the civilian government in terms of saying it's in the best interest of the military's legitimacy to step back on certain things. And I think, for example, in Egypt, this is a very risky game that the military's playing and we're already seeing their legitimacy being eroded in the minds of the public because now that they're openly governing, people are blaming them for the problems of the state. Um, so that might lead some people within the military to go, okay, we, we need to step back. Not necessarily give full control to the civilians, but again, these are all degrees. The second is the issue of, of corruption, which tempts any state entity, including the military, to want more and more power in order to extract more and more rents and more and more resources from the state. And so there certainly has to be a system in place to at least make sure that the military is getting the funds and resources it needs, um, and as well applying, and this is the challenge, applying the anti-corruption rules to the military. But it's hard to do that if everyone is corrupt. So this is where you get into be, even the civilian, uh, in the civilian world, it, it, it corrupts the military as well. And again, we're seeing that in places like Egypt. I think the hardest part is the civil society issue. And that's probably the most disappointing and depressing aspect of the failure of the Arab Spring is um, civil society now is, is smaller and weaker than it has ever been in many of these states, maybe with the exception of Tunisia, that experienced the Arab Spring to the fullest. And civil society was the one that had pushed the people, encouraged them, educated them to go to the streets. So the, the question is how do you strengthen civil society if you're going to adopt the uh, gradual uh, process because even though I am a lawyer, I am very skeptical as to how much changing a constitution or changing laws has in a society where rule of law is weak. If the law is not enforced fairly across people who have power as well as people who don't have power, you can change your constitution all you want. It's not going to make much of a difference. A lot of it really is cultural and um, in the intangible balances of power between the different stakeholders. So I, I think that the challenge right now and the focus should be on strengthening civil society indigenously and not having foreigners like the US or Europe send a bunch of money to build up civil society groups that don't have a constituency within the country, which I think is one of the reasons why um, they, were, uh, they were easily defeated in the Arab Spring in Egypt, for example. 
Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it now to the uh, to the audience. Please restrict yourself to 90 seconds. It could be in form of a question or a comment, but try to be only one question or one comment. All right. I'm going to start. I'm going to move around one and one and one. So in this section, if there are any hands, okay, always. Okay, and come to you later. Go ahead. All right. Let's take this one in the back. Assalamu alaikum, Sabri Samira. All my greetings and uh, thanks. I will be short and immediate. Uh, my short comment about the civilian and military relation and how to improve forward is the elites, the civilian elites. Our major problem in our Middle Eastern countries, the elites are totally weak, divided, not working together. The military is totally organized, focused, well-trained, etc. So they have all the power and all the organization, yet the civil society, mainly all the elites from all uh, backgrounds, Islamic, religious, secular, left, right, they are totally fragmented. So one solution I quickly just suggest to help the professor there is to, for the elites to get together, to dialogue, to reach to a strategy where they can change the civil society forward in balancing the military power. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody from here? Uh, I got one, two, three, I'm gonna, uh, yes, in the middle here, yes. Are you, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm not sure that we're going to talk about the Arab, which we call the Al-Qad al-Madinah al-Askari. And I'm sure that the Arab is that الاتحاد الأوروبي تحديدا وأمريكا هم الذين يدعمون كل السلطات العسكرية في بلاد المنطقة العربية تحديدا وشرق الأوسط فمن أين يمكن للمجتمع المدني أو مؤسسة المجتمع المدني الضعيفة جدا المبتدئة جدا أن تقف أمام هذا الـ الـ الإجرام أو البلطجة الأمريكية الأوروبية الروسية في المنطقة كل واحد له كنتون كل كل مؤسسه الحمد لله كنتون في المنطقه العربيه يعمل لحساب ما يسمونه الديمقراطيه سواء كانت في اوروبا او في امريكا. ارجو من الحضور ان هو يقول يعني مين اللي مين اللي يتعالج الاول المؤسسات المدنيه وضعفها ولا اللي بيقود العالم كله بهذه البلطجه في المنطقه وعلى راسهم امريكا. ثانك يو اوكي ليت مي ترانسليت فيري كويكلي يو سيد ذا كروكس اوف ذا بروبلم اوف ذا بروبلم از ذا uh, which is the sickness of the military uh, civilian relations, but the, the, the main cause in his opinion is the, uh, the power that the United States and the European Union has and their support of these military regimes. And he said, can, how can we have a strong civil military, a, a civilian uh, a society, civil society when you have all these powers supporting the military relations? He said, you know, that we, shouldn't we actually address the issue from uh, the addressing this uh, relationship between the external powers before we ask about strengthening civil society. Uh, I'm going to go this side, and then I'm going to go one more round, and then we'll go to questions. Yes. I'm trying to find some ladies, but I don't see <laughs> hands. Where? OK, I'll come back to you. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, نحن عندما نتحدث عن الديمقراطيات في الدول المتقدمة في أوروبا أو في أمريكا وعدم وقيادة هذه الديمقراطية أو هذه الحكومات للجيش فبالفعل هناك سيطرة على الجيش لكن هذا الجيش للأسف في هذه الدول يتوجه باتجاه الدول الضعيفة مثلا الحكومة الأمريكية تدعم الجيش الإسرائيلي مثلا باتجاه غزة الجيش الأمريكي تدخل في العراق وفتح المجال للميليشيات نحن نريد أن نتحدث عن ميثاق دولي يضبط كما أن الديمقراطية تضبط حركة الجيش في داخل الدول دولها أيضا نريد ميثاق يضمن حركة هذا الجيش باتجاه الدول الأخرى وكذلك في سوريا تدخلت روسيا مثلا لدعم جيش بشار الأسد ضد المدنيين وهذا هو هذا الخلل الذي نعاني منه في العالم شكرا this was a comment that he said the same way the, the problem here again is the uh, the control of the military over the uh, societies in weak countries and he said we have seen the different uh, uh, the external uh, interference but he said shouldn't we have a an international covenant that regulates 
the use of the military internally. Um, I'm going to get, okay, I got, uh, let me get the sister out there in the back. Assalamualaikum. It was a very um, informative session, and I will be very brief. Um, I had a question that, you know, the civil-military relations, the conflicts, what if we strengthen the judiciary and put that on top of the two? Would that be a good solution? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Can I have quickly here? Raise your hand so she can see you. Okay, here, here, right here in the bottom. We'll come back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Croissant, I, I think that you, and I understood that Egypt was not included in your database of 66 countries, and I wonder how did this happen? And uh, considering 70 years of, of military uh, governance in Egypt. Second question actually is an extension of that question, which is the external dynamics. We, yani the two presentations concentrated on the internal dynamics regarding the civil military relationship. However, we, as, we, as we see and as we feel, there is a significant role of, the, of what uh, the outside players uh, do in, in order to uh, empower the military to continue their, uh, their control. The latest example we saw was like a couple of weeks ago when President Trump in the United States decisively, decisively indicated his support to the dictator in Egypt, to Sisi, uh, and he underestimated the popular protests and popular demonstrations. That was a very clear sign to the military to go ahead and continue doing what they, and, and, and starting at that point, they went back to the normal and arresting a lot of people. So the external dynamics actually is, is not just related to supporting dictators, it's related to the interests of the external players. Because the military in our areas are doing functions for the external players. The, the, the military is being used to do things that others cannot do. So how, how can we address this, Yani? Maybe Sahar can... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Shah, 90 seconds. Professor Croissant, um, uh, I wanted to um, express my appreciation uh, in the fact that you've come up with a conceptual framework for reforming post-authoritarian uh, civil military relations. Um, I have two questions. One. Uh, we, in the literature on civil society, there's this kind of conventional wisdom, the civil society, a strong civil society is a bulwark of democracy. Um, and your results also show that civil, strong civil society is correlated with uh, strong civilian control. I was wondering if you could shed some light on the causal mechanism or the, how the two are connected. How does a strong civil society actually uh, boost uh, civilian control? And my second question uh, was with regard to your slides on the, on the regional comparison. I saw that mid the Middle East and Latin America was actually very similar on civilian control, which is rather baffling to me, maybe, uh, or at least counterintuitive, uh, because we know that you know, Latin America may not have full, Latin American countries may not have full control over defense policy, but they seem to have established civilian supremacy or the armed forces. So if you could explain the, the very, um, counterintuitive cross-regional uh, results between Latin America and the Middle East. Thank you. Okay, all right. One here, you got Dr. Sadiq, and then one here from here, and if I have time, one from there. Again, ladies, you have an advantage if you raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the chance. A uh, small reminder to Dr. Corazon about the African Union uh, sanctioning military coups by suspending the, uh, the, the membership of the states. Uh, my question to Dr. Sahar, she, you mentioned uh, the civilian overseeing of the procurement of uh, the military. Uh, you remember uh, Taylor, uh, John Taylor report, which came out in thousands of pages, and all the blame went to the military, uh, to the Pentagon, and not to the civilian, or the Appropriation Committee. The other example, the CIA, the CIA built a complex for more than $2 billion without notifying the Appropriation Committee. And when James Woolsey came in defense of that 
building, he said, this is for the National Reconnaissance Office, and what the office does for the uh, national security is peanuts when you compare the two billions that they already spent on building that building without notifying the appropriation committee. He said, now we have full control of the all uh, satellites orbiting the spheres. We, we can block messages, we can delete messages, we can uh, let alone listening to all messages uh, on, on, on satellites. Uh, so these are two examples in which the appropriation committee was not notified and the military did all what it did uh, in that big report without going back to any civilian uh, instrument in the, in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is here, so I'm going to give him the microphone and then I'll give one more round and then we'll have their comments. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. I have introduced him before. And I, I, I told him that he, uh, he was the former South Africa ambassador to the United States, as well as the premier, the, the first premier or prime minister or governor of the Western Cape. So you have been uh, uh, introduced, and please proceed with your uh, presentation, which is titled Democracy and the Perils of Civil Military Dynamics in the MENA Region. Ambassador Rasul. You can, if you want to come to the podium, or you want to stay there? Okay, very well. Thank you very much. I think between time zones and uh, overnight flight, I got completely confused about where I was at what time. But thank you very much for your patience. I think that the fundamental question particularly for the MENA region, and maybe for the Muslim world as a whole, is whether democracy, human rights, civil society, were credible entities in the Western perspective to start off with. Since the beginning of the 20th century and the arbitrary way in which new states were put together at Sykes-Picot. I don't think that it had anything to do with coherence, with putting entities together that could give rise to democratic governance, to a burgeoning civil society, as well as the idea of strong, counterbalancing forces against the military um, of those states. In fact, it was only articulated much later what the primary design was of these post-empire states would be. I think that where we look at it, the idea far more was what is called the politics of order. The politics of order was not about the form of governance, but the degree of governance. And so the most important distinction, as Samuel Huntington would say in his work, Political Order in Changing Societies, the most important political distinction amongst countries concerns not their form of government, but the degree of government. How strong was the government? How would the government be able to maintain law and order as opposed to giving expression to democracy, to human rights, to freedom, and a burgeoning civil society and democratic governance as a whole? You'd go further to say that what needed to be ensured was the notion of institutionalization. What are the key institutions that will hold those societies together. It was a strong bureaucracy that could administer the state. It was a strong military that was able to maintain order and law and force the will um, over those societies and as well as ensuring stability. In defense of this, and again, I quote him, he says, such institutions may not provide liberty but they do provide authority. 
they do create governments that govern. And so I would start from the premise that the core institution, particularly in the MENA region, was going to be the military in order to achieve the politics of order. Francis Fukuyama would later develop this notion in his book, Trust the Social Virtues and the Creation of Prosperity. He says there are only two alternatives for societies like these. A limited state with self-governance by individuals or a strong state. He says, and I quote him, such a system of a limited state depends ultimately not just on law, but on the self-restraint of individuals. If they are not tolerant and respectful of each other or do not abide by the laws they set for themselves, they will require a strong and coercive state to keep each other in line. And so again, the mirage of democratic self-government, I think, was never on the agenda. I think what was on the agenda was how do you keep those who have arbitrarily been put together in certain states, who may not have belonged together in identity, in language, in madhab, in religion and so forth, how do you keep them together? But certainly the idea was that all the time they should be in a position where they are dominated and that no expression of freedom would be allowed because of these interests that they had to serve. The interests, of course, changed over time. There was the interests that were economic, particularly the flow of oil, but then there were also the interests, which I think was particularly strong after the insertion of the Israeli state that had to be protected and that must never be threatened, and therefore strong militaries on the other side needed to be, to be managed. And then I think that the idea of modernization <coughs> needed to be sold. And so modernization was how do you graduate, and I'm using their perspective, how do you graduate Arab Muslim societies from backwardness to civilization? And that in this graduation from backwardness to civilization, you needed strong military institutions that would be the center of much of the life of those institutions. And, and particularly Egypt showed that, especially after the treaty with Israel, the military became the center not only of society, but of the economy as well. It was the, the driver of economic projects, the creator of infrastructure, and all of those kind of things. So it did not play simply a military role, but it played a social as well as an economic role as things would go on. Particularly in the era after 15 years of almost uninterrupted war, um, Afghanistan 1 and 2, Iraq 1 and 2, um, later the Arab Spring, and so forth. In the 70s, the U.S. military had moved from a conscription-based military to a volunteer-based military. And they had never really envisaged being drawn into conflict where thousands of troops would be sucked into a particular region in order to to, 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 to fight wars, particularly those like in Iraq and, and so forth and Afghanistan that would just pin them down for years. It ended those wars with a deficit in the budget that's now mounting beyond 21 trillion US dollars. It, it has never passed a budget in the last few years. It has simply printed more money to to, 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 to spend its way out of trouble. It was then that certainly they needed to change the way in which the military would operate, particularly in the MENA region. This is when the term regionally aligned forces 
were then invented. And regionally aligned forces meant forfeiting whatever Obama may have called out when he became elected in 2008, 2009 in Cairo, when he said, you must stand up for democracy, these are the values that we stand for, and called out the Arab Spring effectively. But when the Arab Spring happened, it was in misalignment with the idea of the new military and how this military would conduct warfare with declining budgets and with war weariness and a population that did not want to countenance any more body bags coming back. And so the idea of regionally aligned forces said that from now onwards, our job as a United States would be to sell the equipment to the MENA region. We will provide the generals who will do the strategy. We may provide the technology that would be able um, to manage the war, and we would certainly be in the strategic, um, on the strategic bridge that would direct the war, but the fighting and the payment for the fighting has to be within the region itself through what is called regionally aligned forces. And so, out of this, there was no way that they could countenance the idea of the collapse of the military and the rise of democracy to be able to fight a new range of actors that would be emerging, particularly the non-state actors like um, Daesh um, and, and, and others. And so, very clearly, the sacrifice of a burgeoning civil society, civilian life, the sacrifice of democracy, of human rights, and all of those things were, were then uh, effectively made because the return of the military to fit this new military strategy was absolutely um, crucial um, as, things, as things go. And so the point that I'm making is that if, particularly in the 20th century, we had the situation where the Huntington paradigm of the politics of order was supreme in the 21st century. Again, U.S. military needs and U.S. security and U.S. national interests could not allow for civilian life to emerge and to take center stage even when, according to what is touted as U.S. values were called out by Obama in, um, in Cairo. And therefore, the counter-revolution had to happen, and therefore, the return effectively to military rule and the order, um, and the politics of order had to happen. I want to say thirdly and finally that if one were to go through this history that wherever particularly part of the second half of the 20th century, one saw the rise of post-colonial leftism, the kind of socialist projects emerging, whether it was in the Congo, whether it was in Chile and other places, or even a mixture of left progressive thinking plus a surge of Islam or Muslim rule, what we have seen is this playbook, the politics of order being enacted. If we, for example, were to look in the 1953 example, when the Iranians elected a President Mossadegh, again a combination of US-British interests with local um, groups quickly brought that experiment to an end. Exactly the same pattern happened in 1961 in the Congo. As Lumumba started to create a project, Belgium led, supported by the US, the overthrow of Lumumba. I think the same thing people could be saying about 1997 um, in Turkey with, um, with, 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 with the, 
the Erbakan experiment in Turkey, and again, a strong military supported, directed by Western capitals, made sure that no self-determination, no democratic expression, no human rights, no civilian life would be allowed um, to emerge. It is no different to what happened in Egypt in 2013. It's no different to what has happened in Chile in 1973. And there is a definite playbook by which globally milita militaries have cooperated to ensure that there is a complete mismatch between civilian power and military power in these situations, in these countries, but also globally. And so the rather pessimistic point that I conclude with is that it was never on the agenda for post-colonial societies, whether left, Islamist, or just simply democratic, it was never on the agenda for any of those to really um, triumph against the overweening role of militaries, particularly in the MENA regions. I think the playbook has remained constant. It's been theorized by the Huntingtons, by the Fukuyamas. It's one set of rules where you are at home, another set of rules where you want to dominate. And that, I think, has been the story of the 20th century right into the 21st century. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much. Well, now that you opened it, how do we break from this logjam? <laughs> do you have an answer? What was how do we break from this logjam? I think that by not repeating mistakes when a window of opportunity opens. I come from South Africa where we did not have an army and a police force that looked like us, ate like us, prayed like us, dressed like us. They were completely white. And Nelson Mandela, for example, understood that his first priority, he has dreams, he has visions, but he also had to have priorities. And his first priority was to stop counter-revolution, to seduce the army, to make sure that over a five-year period, he does nothing wrong to call out counter-revolution and, in fact, offer them packages, the generals, to start moving out, to retire, to resign. And so I think, at the, and, and maybe that's a mistake we must never repeat, if we ever get to a point where we have a, the glimpse of a democratic breakthrough. So that's the first thing. What do we do? Because militaries will not change their behavior. Leopards don't change their spots, and so you can't expect different behaviors from militaries if they are part of a global project directed from Washington, London, Paris, and so forth. So you can't expect the leopard to change their spot. What we have to do is to change our approaches and our tactics as we, as we move forward. Well, thank you very much. I have five more minutes, and then I'm going to give each uh, presenter five minutes to respond. So I'm going to go back to this. Uh, section. Anybody on this section? Okay, back to here. Yes, in the back. Uh, red shirt. Red shirt, in front of you, and then we'll get to you. The, front, the one in front of you. Yes. I'm from Egypt. My question is for Dr. Croissant. Uh, you said something about the military college will never affect the army or how they think about the people, right? You said something like this? Okay, I don't understand the question. Can you repeat it? Uh, he said something about the military universities that they never affect the ideology of the army or how they think about the people. Okay, I think we got it. Thank you. My question is, uh, how do you think about Sal Sal a new officer in Egypt said, we are, our, we are the people's master, and who lays your hand on their masters, their hand should be cut. So what do you think about this? Mustafa al-Badri in Masr. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يعني اولا احيي الدكتوره سحر على تصريحها بان ما حصل في مصر سنه 52 هو انقلاب لان كثيرا من النخب المصريه تسميه الى الان ثوره واكرر التحيه ايضا على اعترافك بان ما حصل من توليه بعض الانظمه بعد الاستعمار هي انظمه في الحقيقه تابعه للاستعمار وليست وطنيه كما تزعم بعض النخب المصريه لكني اعتب عليك انك قلت لا ينبغي لمنظمات المجتمع المدني ان تنتظر دعما من دول امريكا او الاتحاد الاوروبي وينبغي ان تعتمد على نفسها منظمات المجتمع المدني في بلادنا تحتاج فقط ان تتوقف امريكا ودول الاتحاد الاوروبي عن دعم المنظمات العسكريه التي تحكمنا بالقوه سؤال سريع للدكتور كريسنت حضرتك تفضلت في الجواب عن ما يمكن ان يقوم به المدنيون وقلت يختار منهجية تدريجية لنقل السلطة المدنيين وكذلك تقوية المجتمع المدني وزيادة خبرات أعضائه يعني كيف للمدنيين أن يفعلوا ذلك وليس لهم أي يد في أي شيء داخل مصر أو داخل بلادنا قاموا بثورات وتعرضوا للقتل والاعتقال ويعني اعتداءات عنيفة جدا شاركوا في استحقاقات انتخابية متعددة لكن رغم ذلك لم يجدوا أي سبيل هل مطلوب منهم أن يظلوا في هذه الدائرة المفرغة يقتلوا ويعتقلوا دون أن يعني يصلوا إلى تقدم يعني من مطلوب منهم تحديدا كي يستطيعوا أن يطوروا هذه المنهجية ويصلوا إلى ما يريدون Uh, thank Sahar for her mentioning that the uh, 1952 was not a revolution in Egypt, but rather a coup, and that this, uh, you know, they belong to the to colonialism. Uh, and then his second, his question actually to Dr. Cousin regarding the civil society organizations. He said, uh, "Don't you think that that the problem is not civil society organizations, but the external support, specifically from the United States, that's been supporting these regimes?" And his question is, "You you mentioned that we need to strengthen civil society and that they need to do this and that, but how can we do that when we have suffocating regimes that they don't uh, allow any kind of freedom for people to do anything except repressing and killing and maiming and imprisoning and detaining and all that?" Uh, he said, don't you think that we probably end up, he didn't say it, but I'm adding, at lipping here, that what is needed is its actual revolution to get rid of all these restrictions. All right, I'm going to have two more, two more. Uh, uh, sit in the back here, and then we'll come here. We'll come to you in the back. And we have more sessions on Egypt, so please, <laughs> we have a whole session coming up on Egypt. So if this is an Egypt-related question, save it to the next one. <laughs> وامتداد للسؤال السابق يعني يعني كلنا نعلم مدى القهر اللي بتعيشه الشعوب في في الشرق الاوسط خاصة في مصر وفي في الدول التي حولها يعني عدم تكافؤ بين القوى العسكريه اللي موجوده وبين المجتمع المدني المراكز الابحاث اللي موجوده في الخارج ومراكز الدراسات التي لديها رؤية بالواقع اللي موجود أين دورها ومجتمع ومنظمات المجتمع المدني التي موجودة في أوروبا وفي الخارج وترى الأنظمة بتاعتها بتؤيد هذه الأنظمة القمعية أين دورها قيم الحق والعدل والمساواة التي تلتقي عليها مراكز الأبحاث ومنظمات المجتمع المدني أين هي ودورها من دعم منظمات المجتمع المدني الموجودة في هذه الشعوب المقهورة Thank you this was more of a comment and he was saying in light of the unbalanced and equal relationship between the, the civil society and the military, where are the, the civil society organizations in Europe, in the United States, outside the region who can support actually these efforts? We don't see much of that. He also questioned the role of think tanks who are not uh, saying enough about this. Okay, I get one, one more person here and then I'm gonna go here. And we'll have, believe me, we have seven more sessions. Plenty, <laughs> plenty of. يعني نشكر المنظمين للمؤتمر والسؤال موجه للمنصه الكريمه تانية. لان هو فعلا في الخمسينات يعني من حوالي 65 سنه قال احد المفكرين ان هذه الجيوش التي تتسلح مجتمعه في منطقه الشرق الاوسط لن تطلق طلقه واحده على العدو المستعمل او العدو التقليدي اللي هي اسرائيل. قالوا الى من ستوجه هذه الجيوش؟ قالوا ستوجه الى شعوبها. هذا كان كلام في الخمسينيات وكان بعضنا نقول هذا كلام وتنظيف ولكن الان رايناه راي العين الجيوش تفعل في شعوبها يعني ما لم تفعله الاعداء الحرفي 
يعني شفنا تدمير الجيش السوري عمل ايه اللي كان بيطلق عليه الجيش العربي عمل ايه في سوريا وفي شعبه الجيش المصري عمل ايه في مصر الجيش المفروض في ليبيا حفر عمل ايه في الجزائر في في العشريه عملوا ايه فكيف لهذه الجيوش التي فعلا هي في عقيدتها انها تتسلح باعظم الاسلحه وتلقى دعم خارجي موجه لشعوبها كيف لهذه الشعوب ان تقاوم كل هذه الجيوش التي هي اصلا في عقيدتها انها هي مستعمل بدل المستعمر الطبيعي شكرا Thank you. His question is for the whole panel. And he says that someone was unnamed, said in the 50s that the, these armies, is meaning, you know, meaning the armies across the Arab world, will not uh, shoot one bullet uh, to the enemy, but it, it is being trained so that it will uh, face the people. And we have seen throughout that this is, this is true in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya. We've seen it in Algeria and in, during the 90s. So his question is, how can the people actually face the armies when they are being shot at? All right, I'm going to give five minutes for each, and uh, we'll conclude. Dr. Krissan. Yes. OK, thank you. Five minutes for 15 questions, maybe a bit ambitious. Um, so I will focus on some of the questions. No, 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 uh, yeah, OK, six is good, uh, but I will nevertheless focus on a few questions, uh, especially since I'm not a Middle East expert. Uh, first one, and that um, is a reaction to many of the questions. I think we really have to differentiate between two questions. Question number one is, what explains the lack of democracy in a certain region like uh, Middle East and Northern Africa? And what explains the resilience of military-led authoritarianism? But this question is totally different. It's related to, but analytically, and empirically, and theoretically, and normatively, and ethically. It's different from the second question, that is, what explains change or continuity after transition to democracy? And those are two different questions. With regard to the external support, I'm not a Middle East expert, but I find it highly plausible to assume that the resilience of military-led authoritarianism has something to do with support structures in the international political system. Sounds highly plausible to me. But at the same time, I don't buy the story that it is all external fault. This doesn't seem to reflect the realities of the Arab Spring. But I'm not a Middle East expert. Uh, number two, then, the question, uh, let me focus. Oh, what is uh, the question from Agil Shah? Uh, how, why is civil society important? There are three causal, at least three causal mechanisms. Number one, a vivid or well-developed strong civil society can provide civilians with information and know-how through think tanks, for example, through media, information about what's going on in the military, for example. Number two, more important, a strong civil society can provide legitimacy for civilians. And number three, the stronger civil society, the higher the potential costs of military insubordination, because you have to deal with civil society, which may mobilize in case of insubordination. Why is Egypt not in the sample? Because my, 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 my research that I had presented here includes only new democracies. And also, I'm not a regional expert. According to our data, Egypt in the years 1974 to 2010 was not a democracy. So we didn't include it in our sample. Uh, that's, uh, that's the reason. And if I have one more minute uh, or so, uh, well, I, I, I beg to disagree with the ambassador on many things, but I agree on one thing. Better than to punish military officers is to retire them and to give them a very beneficial retirement package. This works best in regard to civil, uh, one of the best solutions for civil military problems. But you then have to deal with other problems. And I, I assume uh, there was a debate about in South Africa problems and issues of transitional justice. Can you really just retire these guys? Shouldn't they somehow be punished for their role under the authoritarian regime? Human rights uh, violations and so on and the forced corruption? What do you say? Uh, well, from, purely from the perspective of how to reform civil military relations, I would say, well, that's probably the cost. You have to live with a certain amount of injustice in order to heal wounds. Um, from the perspective of a, 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 a scholar who is doing research on democracy, I'm not sure if a democracy in the long run can really live without solving these problems. We will have a presentation on Spain. And I mean, Spain, did they deal with the 
human rights violations under Franco, maybe in the past five to seven years there was a debate about it. So uh, from democracy perspective, I think it's, it's a challenge. From civil military perspective, I think yes, good idea. Sahar. Yeah. Thank you for many of the questions. I have a particular appreciation for the Egypt focus. <laughs> But I'll, I'll try to answer some of them briefly. So the, the first is the role of external actors. And I agree with you that it is both internal and external factors that uh, affect this issue of civil military relations. But what I found intriguing, and maybe the Turkish, the Turkey experts can talk about this during their panel, is in the literature the role of the EU candidacy, Turkey's EU candidacy, how one of the uh, pressure points was that they needed to uh, improve their civil military relations in so far as having the, civ the civilian government uh, be in control, particularly of domestic affairs. And that triggered some reforms internally for the purpose of joining the EU. Uh, not to say there were not other factors at play, but it seems this was a very powerful one. In contrast, you have in the Middle Eastern regimes like Egypt in particular, um, or others that receive large amounts of military aid from the United States, uh, that money is actually for the opposite purpose, which is to strengthen and betras the military, which then emboldens it to, to take on more internal governance roles. So I think all that is to say that we have to explore what is the objective and what is the purpose of the external influence, whether it's military aid or political support. And I think, you know, as someone who, who lives in the United States, I'm certainly very vocal about my uh, disapproval of U.S. aid to Middle East regimes, to their militaries who are being autocratic and oppressive. And the question is, how do you persuade these foreign countries like the United States that it is not in their interest to do that? because they think that they need stable militaries, large, powerful, stable militaries, to serve U.S. interests. And I think the Arab Spring proved that that's not true. And I don't think it, the, the play is over, right? We, we already saw a little bit with Muhammad Ali uh, in Spain bringing the videos of the corruption of the military and Sisi's regime is the people are, it's, the Arab Spring's not over yet. Um, and I think the militaries know that, and we need to tell the United States and Europe that you are not supporting stability. That is not what you're supporting. Now, you're not going to be able to convince the United States not to want hegemony, because that's its national interest. It's a, it's a, it's a superpower that wants to remain the superpower. And so it's really about trying to figure out how is it in the interest of stability to have militaries that are not uh, so abusive and they're not engaging in internal governance. With regard to the civilian elites, so I take issue with that. I have very little faith in the civilian elites, particularly in the Middle East. I think that they are thieves and they tend to create oligarchies that want strong militaries to serve them, not the people. So they're upset that the military is not sharing the stolen wealth. And right now, for example, in Egypt, you have the military apparatus taking over the private sector and squeezing the business elites, which is creating another enemy for the, for the military. And they're essentially, um, it's, it's, it's a gang of thieves that are fighting over who gets to steal from the country while the poverty rate increases. So this is where I think civil society is more important than the civilian elites as a group because civil society in theory will be diffused in terms of its influence, hopefully across class, across geographic uh, regions. And civil society doesn't just mean human rights organizations or um, you know, organizations that call for political freedom of elections, etc. It's also social services, education and health, and many of the basic services that the state is failing to provide because the state is bankrupt, because the dictators are stealing the wealth of the country, and the dictators sometimes are you know, military run, sometimes are civilian run. Okay, with regard to the judiciary, um, you know, I've written an article, a lengthy article about judicial independence or lack thereof in Egypt. It's called accountability, uh, or excuse me, independence without accountability. Um, there's two problems. First is 
it's very easy to get the judiciary out of the picture because you just create, you just put everything under military court jurisdiction. So anything related to the military, civilian courts have no jurisdiction, and therefore civilian judiciary, you're out. Legally, you're out. Um, and then even if you legally allow them jurisdiction, uh, the entity with the guns is the most powerful, and the judiciary doesn't even have a police force to enforce its its ruling. So I don't think that we should. Re I don't think we should put too much. Uh, effort or emphasis on the judiciary. They're fighting their own battle, just trying to keep their independence in the civilian space, unfortunately. Um, finally, and this is something more for the political scientists in the room to maybe, you know, respond in, in future panels, uh, but I wonder if internally if there is some value in creating more competition among powerful state institutions as a check on each other. So that it's not so much persuading the military to do the right thing or persuading the civilian elite to do the right thing, et cetera, but it's creating certain structures where powerful elites are all and institutions are competing with each other and they don't want the other one to be power, too powerful because they may take the property, you know, the wealth of the country or they may try to, to, to be autocrats. So for example, you see this with the internal security and the military forces and they can sometimes be a check on each other. Um, the judiciary, again, to some extent, there's the civil bureaucracy, there's the business elites, um, there's the religious elites, depending on the country, and maybe if the workers are powerful, maybe they could be uh, a check. But again, trying to create more competition, and that's what keeps uh, the various institutions, including the military, um, in check. Uh, so finally, I'll just say that there is a common interest in having a competent professional military, and I think that's something that's even within the military. And I don't think the solution is saying, oh, we just need to eliminate the military, we need to weaken the military, we need to marginalize it. Because the reality is if the military is weak or non-existent, you get militia groups. You, you get non-state actors who fill the vacuum. You have to have some entity that provides basic security. Um, and, you, I, and if there isn't that, uh, and the military, although there is the internal security, obviously, but the military is kind of the broader one, you're also subjected to external threats. So I, I don't think we should take the position that the military is just bad and we should... Um, you know, el eliminate it. It's more about reform, reforming it. Oh yeah, good luck with that. Uh, but, but one problem is I think cultural is in people in Egypt might appreciate this or looking in Egypt is I have found it very fascinating that when I talk to people who are in the military in Egypt, they really think they're doing the right thing and saving the country. They think they're the smartest. They think they're the least corrupt. They think they're the hardest working. They think they're the most competent. And they look down on civil society, on business elites, on the general population as being lazy, as being corrupt and not honest. And I, I found that to be a fascinating paradox because when you're on the outside, you think it's like that they are these malicious actors, but they feel that they have this really great burden to try to save the country. And um, so I think we need to kind of think about that and, and figure out how we can take those good intentions and persuade them that you are destroying your, you're going to implode if you become the government and you really need to step back and focus on the external threats and, and, and support internal reforms that in theory would create more democratization. But that question, I mean, the, the democratization question is not simply about the military. There are many, many civilian actors in the Middle East who do not want democracy. So, so we have to keep that in mind. Thank you, Ambassador Ibrahim. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks very much. And just listening to my fellow panelists, I feel absolutely more regretful that I've not um, heard them more fully. But let me, let me say that I don't think in South Africa we've taken an anti-military stance. I think it was a way of how to make the military accountable to the civilian rule, accountable to the constitution, justiciable in the judiciary and not by their own rules and by their own judges and so forth. And I think we've reached that point because you do not show the fist right at the beginning. Because had Mandela taken an anti-military stance, he would have invited counter-revolution. And so I think in many cases the idea of gradualism may be a discredited one, but I would far rather be in government 25 years later and incrementally doing good than to be gloriously out of government 
in one year or two years. And I think that we need to rethink a lot of the tactics and strategies that go with it. And at any given point, a repressive military may look very powerful. But the one thing we've learned in South Africa during the anti-apartheid struggle was to always weigh up what are the balance of power at a particular point and what's the balance of forces at a particular point? Because if you confuse the two, they, your challenges look, just look insurmountable. You can't make a breakthrough. But in terms of the balance of power, and the apartheid right up till the time of Nelson Mandela's release, we would have counted the balance of power to be the military is on their side, the bureaucracy is on their side, the police is on their side, the laws are on their side, the judiciary is on their side, and therefore all the institutions of power were against us. But when we asked the question, but what's the balance of forces? We then began to see that the support of the majority of people are with us. International civil support was with us that the institutions of governing at a local level could not do their job. They could not collect taxes. They could not collect the rates. They could not um, enter the townships. And therefore, that micro rule was with us in that sense of the balance of forces. The balance of forces, the major non-state institutions like the Catholics, the Anglicans led by Tutu, the Muslims, the this, the that, and the other, they all knew what was morally right. And so what I'm saying is that the situation may look completely bleak, but you've got to separate out. And when we then understood that here we had a military that had been given the nuclear bomb by Israel, that were given the latest technology to fight the Cubans and the Russians in Angola and Namibia and everywhere else, that had U.S. military advisors directing the war, the Cold War, um, using the South African Defense Force. But on the other hand, we then discovered what's the counterbalance. And so in much the same way that militaries cooperate, repressive militaries cooperate globally, liberate, liberating civil societies need to operate globally. And so we went to the citizenry of the United States to start the sanctions campaign, the divestment campaign, to build the anti-apartheid movement into one of the most important counterbalances, so much so that Senate and Congress were forced to veto Ronald Reagan's veto of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act. And so I think the idea is not to be sucked onto the terrain that is the military. That's why we never glorified the ANC's guerrilla army, because we knew in a straight-out fight we could never match them. They were simply a propaganda adjunct to the civil political work that I think needed um, um, to be done. And that's why I'm not sitting here bleak that because the militaries are strong that um, we are on a hiding to nothing. I think history presents windows which open and then close. And the, the wisdom with which we go through those windows when they open are absolutely crucial. And, and I think that one of the things that hold us back is that civil societies are by themselves often fragmented. We must delay the crucial decisions that will come 10 years later about whether we will have a, a secular state or an Islamic state. Those are things which you only decide once you have a firm grasp on power, but to speak about those too early is to fragment the very civil force that you rely on to bring about that revolution. And that's why South Africa, for example, only had five major demands. We want a united, non-racial, democratic, non-sexist, and free South Africa. All the rest were details which we delayed until we'd come to writing the Constitution, whereas so many of us are so busy with the details of what we will do when we win that we never get to the point of winning because we are so fragmented <coughs> and we fragment the balance of forces as we go on. And so I, 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 I just thought that that was 
an absolutely crucial one. We only wrote our constitution two years after the elections. We didn't go into the elections with a constitution because we needed to see how much power we can, we can gather to write the constitution we want. I think in much the same way, we only started the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, not before the election, not at the election, but afterwards, once we had the levers of power. Then one can show how do you go after those that need to be gone after. I think that you call the military back into action once you do gestures which threaten um, what they regard as law and order and stability in a society. So we've got to play chess with the military. They often look like blunt instruments, but you've got to play chess with them because that's their business to play chess all the time. And civil society has so much more in the balance of forces when they don't appear to have much by way of the balance of power. Thank you very much. See, so we have an arm wrestling match here, <laughs> not a chess board. We should have a chess board. I want to thank our esteemed presenters for excellent presentations, excellent start for this conference. We, uh, they, they posed many questions and they gave fewer answers, but certainly within the realm of our interests. And I'm sure that uh, throughout this conference, the next uh, a few days, we will learn much more, especially when we talk about specific cases. I want to thank again uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the presentations because they really opened our eyes to, to issues that may have not been uh, noticed. And I think some of the things that have been said towards the end, the question of gradualism, actually is, is something that many people who are uh, struggling for civilian control may want to look into because these are counterintuitive to what most people are saying. So this is something I think I take from this uh, particular panel, you know, that issue and to, to study all the things uh, around them. So I want to thank them. I want to end also by presenting each one of you with, uh, with your award. Uh, thank you very much. That ends our first panel. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, 4.30 back in the room. Uh, you have about a 30-minute break. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.